Hello guys, I'm Lauren Smith and I'm studying a degree in theoretical physics. I'll be bringing you through to 2019's higher level question 7 today. This question is all about electricity and it's actually a pretty nice question. So we better get started with it. Here's the first look at question 7. And up here we have a little blurb about electric fields and potential differences generated between a thundercloud and the ground. People preparing the exam would like to find a connection between electricity and some concept maybe found in nature. All in all the information presented here is generally unimportant. It won't really help us apart from giving us a context to the question with the actual questions. Now we're asked a series of questions on this so let's get to it. Before I start answering part 1 I'd like to draw your attention to page 61 of the Formian Tables book when we are looking at potential difference in particular and we will be quoting this formula directly in our answer. In part one we're asked what is meant by potential difference and we're asked to state its unit. The answer is as follows now you can either provide the mathematical or the verbal notation. I'm going to give you the verbal notation first and it's just simply work done which will get you three marks per unit charge which will give you the next three marks. The mathematical notation, on the other hand, I'm just going to put an or there. You get three marks for explicitly writing down the formula, i.e. copying it from the formula in tables book. We don't even need to learn it off. It's very, very handy, which is why I would always, always, always recommend, even if you prefer the verbal definition, to put the formula down. You're guaranteed marks. Now for your next three marks for the mathematical description of potential difference, you're going to have to notate your formula, i.e. you're going to have to label all of the variables in your formula and that will get you your next three marks. Now for your final three marks to make a total of nine marks in the question you're going to have to state its unit which is the volt. Again nine marks in total. And again for part two I'm going to draw your attention to page 61 of the Foreman Tables book where we're going to look at electric field strength in particular and again we're going to need this formula to answer our question. Okay so in part two we're asked to define electric field strength. Now you can either give the verbal or the mathematical notation like in part one. I'm going to first give you the verbal notation which is just that electric field strength is the force which will get you three marks per unit charge which will get you the next three marks or you can answer this mathematically by popping down this formula here and notating it just like we did before and that the electric field strength is equal to the force over the charge and this charge is the magnitude of charge on the particle in question. Now, for the formula, you're going to get three marks. And for notation, you're going to get three marks. Now, they don't explicitly ask for the unit. But since we were asked for the unit in the previous part of the question, part one, about the potential difference, I always put it down here. Because you never know what the marking scheme will be actually like. But you can judge that yourself. And the unit, of course, for electric field strength is Newton per coulomb. Right, moving on to our next part of the question, we're asked to describe how an insulated spherical conductor can be charged positively by induction. And I've included a diagram, which I include to the right here, as well as the verbal steps. You don't necessarily have to put in a diagram because it doesn't say specifically, OK, draw with the aid of a label diagram or describe with the aid of a label diagram. But it does help you yourself describe this demonstration, but also the examiner. So if you are not so great with explaining words off the top of your head, again, it can happen under exam pressure. Diagrams do always help. Okay, so for your first three marks, you have to say that you bring a negatively charged rod close to the conductor, but it must not be touching. Because as you can see here in the first diagram, we have a separation of charges here and that the positive charges are in the insulated spherical conductor are being attracted to the negatively charged rod. Your next step, which will get you another three marks, is that you need to earth the conductor. This can be done by placing your finger on it. Again, I'd say how you would earth the conductor in your answer. I'd include that. And that can be shown in the next step of this diagram in which we have the electrons or the negative charge flowing in and out of the finger. And just to let you know that earthing is to make contact with the Earth's surface in electricity. Now finally, for your final three marks, you have to remove your finger and also take the rod away. But that is implied in what we were saying and also in the diagram here. And we're just left with a positively charged spherical conductor. Now, this demonstration also uses concepts such as opposite charges attract and like charges repel electricity. Now, of course, we are back to our question and down here 
We are told that a spherical conductor has a diameter of 12 centimeters. Note that it says diameter and not radius and that it is charged positively by induction. And we're asked a couple of questions here and here with this information. First things first, we're asked to draw the electric field around the charge conductor. We are told that it is positively charged. Therefore, this will dictate the electric field lines which we will draw in this diagram. Now, the purple sphere is obviously going to be our spherical conductor. You can see that here. And we need to have what's called radial field lines, which is what I have here. Now, electric field lines are radial. What does this mean? It means that they intersect at a point and spread out or travel towards it evenly in all directions. The point here being the center of this charged conductor. And as you can see, for a positively charged conductor, your electric field lines will be radially outward. If it were negatively charged, the radial field lines will be inward. For including radial field lines in your diagram, you'll get three marks, but also you'll get another three marks for including that these radial field lines will go away from the charge conductor. Now you might think, okay, why are there loads of positive signs on the surface of the conductor? The main reason is that a conductor which is charged, all the charge must lie on the surface, not within it at all. Okay, so moving on to the next section of our question, which is the calculations question. I do need to draw your attention to a couple of pages in the Vorman Tables book. The first one being where we're going to be looking at Coulomb's law and the electric field strength formula. And next we're going to need page 47 for we will be using the permittivity of free space constant in our calculation. Okay, so the, looking at the question, we are told that there is an electric field strength of 2.3 newtons per coulomb at a distance of 5 centimeters from the surface of the spherical conductor. Note that it is just from the surface, as you can see in the diagram I have drawn here. Now we are asked to calculate the charge on the conductor. And we will be using these two formulas here, like we saw in the Foreman Tables book. Now, remembering back to our original question, we were told in, in the information we were given that the diameter of the spherical conductor is in fact 12 centimeters. Now, why is this important? Given that the formula that we're going to be using, i.e. Coulomb's law and the electric field strength formula, I would like to point out that these formulas consider point charges only. So even though we are looking for the charge on the surface of the conductor, because this is what is physically happening, we shall consider this charge co as a point charge, i.e. that the whole charge on the conductor is concentrated at the center of the conductor. And this works for calculations. Okay, so looking at the right hand side formula, i.e. Coulomb's law, we can represent Q1 and Q2 as the point charges fixed at a distance d apart. We're going to consider Q2 to be here, let's say. It is at this point where the electric field strength is 2.3 newtons per coulomb. And Q1 is going to represent the charge on the conductor, which we are going to consider it being concentrated at the center. So it's going to appear here. Therefore, the distance between these two point charges is going to be just 5 centimeters plus 6 centimeters, giving that the distance is equal to 11 centimeters. Since we need to always work in SI units, we're going to convert this into meters, which gives us a distance d, present in this formula here, at 0 0.11 meters. But how does this allow us to find the charge on the conductor? If you look closely here at the schematic, we can see that Q2 just represents this Q in the left formula for the electric field intensity formula. So we can amalgamate these two formulas, i.e. giving us this expression here, but you can see that we have a Q2 on both sides, so we can just cancel them, giving us this formula here. And this is the electric field intensity in terms of the charge on this conductor and the distance between the two point charges. And the distance between the point of the electric field strength in question and the charge on the conductor. Now we know the electric field strength, we know the distance, and these three symbols here are just constants, so we can find Q1. 
Okay, so here I've just rewritten the formula we had derived previously, just a few moments ago. And of course, I'm going to substitute in all of our values so that finally we can get what the charge on Q1 is. And just for reference, all of the values which I substituted into the formula, I've put on the row. Okay, so let's put this all into our calculator and find out what the charge on Q is. Okay, calculator up on screen. Let's multiply these four terms together with, of course, using brackets just makes everything a lot easier to type out and also you're less inclined to make any calculator errors. We have 2.3 times 4 pi times 8.85 .8 times 10 to the power of minus 12 times 0 0.11 meters all squared. Just again checking to see if we got everything incorrectly which I'd recommend you to do before clicking that equal sign. And there we have it. We have a quite a small charge here and, it, and luckily it's given to us in scientific notation. So all we need to do is round say to one decimal place or two significant figures. Rounding to two significant figures, that gives us a total charge on Q to be 3.1 times 10 to the power of minus 12 coulombs. Please do not forget your units, you will lose marks. Okay, so this calculations question here goes for six marks, but where indeed do you get these six marks? Well, of course, we know in physics that putting in our formulas in the answer is very, very important. And this can be seen from the marking scheme, because if you either put down this formula, this formula, or indeed this formula, you will get your first three marks out of six. Two of these formulas can be copied directly from the formula in tables book. So again, put down any formula you think is relevant into your answer because already we have the marks for this question. And finally, you're going to get your last three marks for the actual answer. There you have it, six out of six. Okay, so in the next part of our question, we are asked to explain how point discharge occurs. And I've included a diagram. Again, it's not explicitly asked for, but it does help to convey your point. Especially in physics, diagrams can be very, very important. It can also give you a little bit of context in the exam. You will be under a lot of time pressure. Well, we hope not. So how does it occur? Basically, if charge accumulates enough at a pointed end, it attracts nearby positive ions from the air and causes them to accelerate towards the pointed end. This little statement here will get you your first three marks. Your next three marks will be for saying that these accelerating ions are likely to crash off other molecules and therefore ionizing the air around the point. For a total of six marks, you need to state that ions with opposite charge to that on the point attract to the end and neutralize the charge on it. Ion with the same charge move away. This can be seen in the diagram up here. The positive charge accumulated at the point is here, but up here we have what's called electric wind caused by the ions with the same charge as that on the pointed end and they move away in a rush because they are repelled by the pointed end and this is noticed. And finally, we are asked to describe how point discharge can be demonstrated in the laboratory and it is as follows again I have included a diagram again I find them very helpful especially in physics and it really can help you explain your knowledge on the subject at hand okay so first things first we're going to attach a nail to the surface of a van de Graaff generator which is the charge point in question as you can see up here that will get you your first three marks for your next three marks you have to bring up a candle to this charge point and what will you notice in this demonstration? You will notice that the flames move away from the Van de Graaff, creating an electric wind. Two marks. Just like we saw in the previous part where we were explaining a point discharge occurred and a Van de Graaff generator basically generates a lot of charge up here on this part here, which then is transferred to the charge point or the nail.